All right, now we're going to get big again. Um, Hubble Telescope. I've, I've put out a handful of YouTube videos for you guys to, to keep an eye on. Um, over on the side column, amongst all the other garbage they show you, if you see something show up about the Hubble, check it out. Uh, it was Edwin Hubble was one of the uh, 1900s, sort of, 19, not the century, but 19, you know, 20s um, astronomers who really figured out what was going on with the universe. He was one of the first to show evidence that it was expanding, um, something we'll talk about in the future here, and, and just all these amazing things. But again, he was limited by his tools. So when we had our first space telescope, think a picture a satellite, okay? Uh, a satellite up in space, but a satellite up in space with a telescope lens on it. And what it allowed, again, not the 200 miles up that it is or, or whatever, it's not very high, but it's above the atmosphere. And that atmosphere adds fuzz, it adds static, it adds whatever you want to call it, it adds interference. This is why if you ever see, you know, these people, if you watch Discovery Channel or whatever, um, and they're looking at these telescopes, they're always up on hills, okay? They want to put these things up as high as they can humanly get them. Um, there's one on Hawaii, I forget if it's Mauna Loa or wherever. As high as they could get the dang thing, because it's that much less atmosphere to, to look through, and they'll get that much clearer picture. So, back to my point, when we finally had the wherewithal to, to make a space telescope, they named it after Edwin Hubble, who who spent countless hours um, behind his, I think he worked at Mount Wilson in California, um, behind his telescope, and, and gave us some of the most important data we'll ever have. And so it's fitting that, that the Hubble which had its own horrible story as well. I, I won't go into it now, but I'm, I'm sure there's a at least a Wikipedia article, um, but countless YouTube videos, I'm sure, as well. Once we got the Hubble up there and working right, we saw some amazing stuff. Um, this is one of the most famous images that came from it. it uh, it's part of the Eagle Nebula. Um, it's dubbed the Pillars of Creation, and uh, I want to say it was the mid to late 90s when we got this image, and it, it's you, you'll laugh, you'll be like, yeah, who would buy that? I mean, it was like on t-shirts and coffee mugs. It, it was insane how just mind-blown people were that we were seeing a nebula. We've talked about nebula already, right? Clouds of gas and dust. Uh, we've shown you a couple. Um, anecdotally, you might have seen the cat's eye nebula or the crab nebula. Um, but, and many of those images weren't possible until we had the Hubble as well. But this one was one of the first, and it just captured people's minds that we had these these towers, these pillars. I guess that there was there was art in space for lack of a better word. I think that's really what it was. So, when the scientists saw this, they did they, you know, this was data. This was new information. So, they knew that nebulas were clouds of gas and dust and they knew that they would collapse in upon themselves and and spark up stars. But I don't really think that they expected to see. You see these multiple hot spots in here. Boom, 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 over here. Okay. Rub your hands together. You hear mine. You feel that warmth, that heat, that, that friction. That's the same energy that's happening there as this, these molecules are collapsing down in on themselves. And it, it's sparking up. And it's, you know, the idea that perhaps maybe we could get multiple stars out of out of a single nebula or does one nebula go down into to multiple stars or it, it, it just so much that they had to study so much new information for them all right so what you saw was just a snippet of this 
and uh, unfortunately my my capture window is just a little shy of hope you're seeing a lot of it um, this is an immense structure okay first of all it's 7,000 light years away so six trillion miles times 7,000 it's 9.5 light years tall long whatever word you want to use there's no up or down in space it's immense it's massive this was probably made out of you've heard of mosaicing okay many many pictures or tiles sutured together more than likely this was not taken in one image but many 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 images sutured together it's so far away it's so big and I don't know that I see an eagle maybe there's a wing there's a wing there's his tail feathers maybe he's got a big old fish down here or he's splashing some water but somebody saw you know it's his it's as crazy as some of those constellations, right? When you look, some of them are very obvious, like Cat's Eye Nebula. Totally get that one. Um, but uh, but maybe today I'm seeing the eagle in here. I don't know. So you guys have had this before, okay? Um, typically, or eh, typically, oftentimes in a semester, I don't do as much background um, astronomy stuff as I'm covering right now. So you do happen to know what a nebula is, a cloud of gas and dust that condenses into a star. But it's here just as a reminder. Remind you that a nebula is both the beginning and the end of a star. It's a stellar nursery and a stellar graveyard. Start with the graveyard. Um, it's what's left over after a star explodes. Okay, We call it going supernova when a star explodes it's the way a star one of the ways a star can die uh, another way is a is a black hole okay um oh i hope i left the black hole stuff in here anyhow one of the, one of the ways a certain size star can die is by exploding and and what happens is that um hold on let me see what's actually Ooh, i don't have that stuff in here Okay, well, I'm just going to touch on this then. There's there's not a slide for it, but I know I always talk about it. I, maybe before I publish this, I'll try to add um, some slides for this information here, but take notes nonetheless. So in a star, you may or may not know, a star typically turns hydrogen into helium. Okay, that's what a star does. And you get energy from that. I understand energy of fission, splitting things in half. You split something in half, you release energy. That makes sense to me. Energy of fusion, hydrogen plus hydrogen equals helium. Again, I've explained to you, I'm, I'm not a, I don't quite get physics a lot of it. This is one of those things where energy from fusion, I, I don't quite get. But that's the, what fuels the sun. That's what fuels almost all the, all the stars. Hydrogen into helium. Anyhow, as they get older... Okay, um, they move up through the periodic table and slowly start fusing those heliums, and then they fuse what comes next, and they fuse what comes next. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. You remember the periodic table, right? It fuses. It goes up to iron. Okay, a star can only fuse up to iron, and if for some strange reason you just whipped out a periodic table to see what I was talking about, you'll realize that iron isn't very far in. Iron isn't very far in, and we have the rest of the periodic table as well. So what happens is during a supernova, we're able to fuse elements beyond iron. Supernovas are where we've gotten all of our elements that show up in that periodic table beyond iron. I didn't really preface this with anything, and I, and I apologize. S stars are fusion engines. Stars are all we had in the very beginning. And hydrogen, as the simplest element, was all we had in the beginning. Over the, the millennia, over the, 
millions and millions and millions of years that this has been going on, they've been building more and more ingredients throughout the universe to use to build more and more complex things. Stars make every element. And it's one of my favorite phrases from the 70s. It's, we're all stardust, baby. Um, it is true, okay? Um, the, the stuff we're made of came from the stars. And uh, as I said, none of that would be possible without this, the supernovas because that allows us to fuse beyond iron. So anyhow, the star explodes, it hits iron, uh, it can fuse no more, it collapses in on itself, and it explodes. The heat from the supernova is so immense that it allows the elements um, to fuse beyond that. Okay, uh, And you're left with, guess what, a cloud of gas and dust that has new elements in it. Well, those elements will eventually, that cloud of gas and dust, those elements will eventually condense in, form a new star, form new planets. It's a cycle. They've estimated that to get the elements that we see, our star, the sun, is, I forget, it's the third or fourth generation. Okay. Our solar system is four and a half billion years old, 4.6 to be exact, for lack of a better word. The universe is about 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. Again, best as they can estimate. We'll talk about how they estimate it later. Um, there's enough time for cycles to happen in there. All right. Um, they say the earliest stars went through their cycles so quickly. Um, live fast, die young kind of thing. Okay. Um, so the, 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 not always as long as, as the current cycle that we're in. Uh, the implication that I got out of it at any rate is that the, the longer the generation, the higher the generation you're in, the longer the star cycle tends to last. Um, but we're third to fourth generation, and that gives us the elements that we've got. When our star, the sun, explodes again, all right, which it will, and they say about, we're kind of in the middle of our cycle, um, from what I've gathered, another four and a half billion years or so, five billion years. It will slowly uh, expand, engulfing the planets. Uh, it'll go out, I forget, just a little past Mars, I think, and then it'll smoosh down in on itself and explode outward. All right, It's going to make new elements. So the folks that are learning uh, chemistry and and geology and whatever else cares about elements um, in that new earth that gets made after the sun goes through uh, and, and makes a new solar system, well, they're going to have a different periodic table than you guys. I think that's kind of a cool thought. All right, slightly less craziness right now. Uh, let's go talk about something that you could actually look up and, and see and not just have to ponder. Um, our closest galaxy, okay? Our closest galaxy. We already introduced the idea to you that there's many, many, many galaxies out there, okay? Not just ours. Uh, that many of the stars you look up at the night and see, if you had um, some sort of bionic eye, you would actually be able to zoom in and realize that, hey, that's not a star, that's actually a galaxy. Well, the closest galaxy to us is the Andromeda, okay? And it is 2 million light years from Earth. So we talk about planet hopping, we talk about star hopping, and even some of these movies talk about galaxy hopping. We'd have to go 2 million light years. And again, I'm just going to drop the math at this point. But you remember how far a light year is. All right, 6 trillion times 2 million. I don't know if your calculator has that many digit spaces on it. Anyhow, there she be. Uh, I think it just said 220,000 light years in diameter for the Andromeda. M31 is its catalog number. It's like Messier, I think is the way they pronounce it. It's a, probably a person, human, that decided to start cataloging these um, galaxies. Excuse me. And um, 
we take a lot of pictures of Andromeda. A lot of pictures. <clears throat> we like Andromeda because, well, A, it's nice and close to us, relatively speaking. And B, it's a spiral galaxy, which is what we think we live in. We're going to tell you soon. Uh, hopefully you knew you live in the Milky Way, right? Uh, we're going to tell you that the Milky Way is, is, we feel that it's a spiral galaxy. Because we're in it, it's really hard to observe the Milky Way itself. So I, I reckon if you go out there and you Google galaxy images, that you're going to see more spiral galaxies than anything else because that's what we tend to take pictures of the most because we want to understand the galaxy that we live in the most. Yeah, sure, it's cool to see what other shapes they come in, and there's plenty of other shapes, don't get me wrong. But we want to um, see about our own galaxy. So that's why we look at Andromeda so much. Now, I may have mentioned to you earlier that we were out in the western spiral arm, sort of the backwaters. Okay, what that means is we're kind of out here. We're a star way out here, and your solar system's going around doing its thing there. And we're, of course, then the sun is spinning around here. We mentioned, uh, I think, in one of the previous lectures, that to make one rotation in the Milky Way takes about 200 million years. All right. So we got all that going on for us. That's why you'll see a lot of pictures of, of these. Uh, here's another one, M74. This is a top view. really like this one because you can actually see the spiraling arms coming off of here. Here's what a spiral galaxy looks like in cross-section, if you would, kind of looking at it almost straight head on. I googled a long time ago what NGC stands, it's like National Galactic Catalog or something like that, but it's just another cataloging system. Um, I don't know why they have multiple, probably because they were started at, you know, about the same time and the other, one person didn't know the other person was doing it kind of thing. But uh, a lot of them, you know, there's just too many to name. You want to, you know, you name one or two after yourself when you find them and then you, it gets kind of old. So they just start to, to catalog number them. So I want to go back to here. Um, again, some slides that, that, that aren't in here at the moment, and, and perhaps I'll, I'll add a bit to them. I don't want to ask you guys about what's going on right here. I promised you we wouldn't get too far out, but, but here we are again. What's here? I'm making you think. Well, I'm guessing that many of you just thought, well, that must mean star density is getting really, really, really high. Okay, uh, we see, you know, all these stars glow uh, we see individual stars out here. You already showed us that star field picture. Um, and, and it just makes sense, right? And that's exactly what astronomers thought for a very, very long time. Exactly what you just probably thought. Turns out they were wrong. And I'm sure there were a handful of folks that, that said, Ah, see, I, I knew that. I knew that. Um, what that is, supposedly is a black hole. They now feel that at the center of darn near every spiral galaxy is something called a black hole. Well, I hope you're saying that that, that isn't black. Professor G, that's not dark. It's, it's very, very lit up. It's very bright. That is the opposite of what I would think a black hole would look like. And you're right. Um, what you're seeing there is something called the event horizon. Okay, uh, a black hole, first of all, isn't a hole. Um, it is a very, very, very densely packed um, ball, a point. Um, I suppose a point is the proper word, but to picture it better, picture a ball. Um, and remember that we mentioned that with mass comes gravity. And this is the thing about a black hole, is that it is so incredibly dense, it is so incredibly massive, that it has an, an unbelievable 
unbelievable gravitational pull. And they, they, they say, and it took me a while to actually process this, that it's so strong that not even light can escape it. Okay, well, what's so special about light? Well, light is energy, and energy is, is matter, and at some level it's all the same, but the point is, is it's, it's, it's dang near massless, okay? It has mass, or it can't be matter, but it is very light, pardon the term. So the gravitational pull is so strong from this, this thing we're calling a black hole that it sucks even light energy into it. So this event horizon, the word I used a couple moments ago, this event horizon is that last sort of edge or lip before the light energy gets sucked into and becomes this dense cold blackness. So you don't see the black hole itself. In fact, and I hope I could find an image and, and augment this before again before I post the, the thing proper, or I might even just have to post it and then post another ver an updated version of it with the, some new slides in it. There's a we were talking about telescopes earlier. They they made a new kind of telescope called an X-ray telescope, and. Um, what an X-ray telescope does, as the name might imply to you, is it looks at um, wavelengths in the X-ray field. I, I, I should premise this by saying the, the Hubble telescope, remember we just looked at that and we saw all the pretty pictures? Hubble looks at visible light, just like you would if you have a telescope in your backyard, your front yard, you go to an observatory, whatever. That's looking at visible light spectrum. An X-ray telescope, a radio telescope, so on and so forth. Those look at other wavelengths. You dig? All right. So, with the radio, uh, I'm sorry, the X-ray telescope, um, they're looking for radio uh, X-ray frequencies. So, Chandra, C H A N D R A, was a X-ray telescope they put up eh, twenty years ago, maybe, and they saw these giant jets of x-rays shooting out of both sides of a spiral galaxy like an axle on a bicycle wheel or if you follow me a paddle wheel okay so this galaxy is spinning around in circles and these jets of x-rays shooting out of the center the top and the bottom and the only thing they could figure out that was capable of generating that kind of energy was a was a black hole so that's why they think at the center of every spiral galaxy now is a black hole. So yes, at the center of our galaxy, there is quite probably a black hole as well. Even though it looks like a really, really bright hole. It doesn't even look like a hole. A bright spot. All right. Time to pause this recorder again. <laughs>